Well, I'm going to give you seven questions today. You, are you a note taker? You don't have to be. Uh, but if you are, I'm going to give you seven questions, and then I'm going to ask you to ask those questions to somebody else later today. So here, let's start off right at the beginning here. The man and his wife, uh, after a hard week, uh, they decided that they were going to take a little break. Man, they were exhausted. Anybody have a hard week this week? Uh, so they were exhausted. They were sitting on their porch. It was a summer day, and uh, they were sipping a glass of wine. Yeah, I know I said wine in a Baptist church. And, um, and, uh, and so it was real quiet. They were just kind of reflecting on their day. They weren't saying a whole lot. They were so exhausted. And all of a sudden, the woman broke the silence, and she said, I love you, and I don't think I could ever live without you. To which the husband said, is that you or the wine talking? To which the wife said, it's me, and I'm talking to the wine. Full disclosure, I'm a complete abstainer from alcohol, but I want you to know I love that story. I love that story because she was passionate about wine. First question, what are you passionate about? Isn't that a great question? When you're getting to know somebody, what are you passionate about? I love motorcycles. I've had one since I was 16. I travel the country on them. I love them. I love riding motorcycles. I love electric guitars and Half-stack martial amps. These are things I love. It kind of tells you a little bit about who I am, right? And that's the fun thing about getting to know somebody. When you ask questions like, what are you passionate about? You get to know somebody, right? And, and that's a good question this morning, but I'm not sure that's the only question I want to ask because it's, even though it's fun to get to know each other and you ask what's passionate about, if I ask you right now, what are you passionate about? you might be tempted to lie because you're in church. Am I right? I didn't lie. I said electric guitars, and I said, what else? I said guitars and I, motorcycles, right? I didn't give the churchy answer this morning, did I? But when we're in church and someone asks you what you're passionate about, you know what happens? Oh, my goodness. We, we tend to lie. We say, St what are you passionate about? The church. Really? The only time you think about it is on Sunday. I mean, do you think about it all the time like that? Are you really passionate about it? Jesus, God, the Bible, these are all the right answers, but they're Sunday school answers, right? Sometimes when we're at church, we say those things because that's what we hope it really is, but it's not really true. So maybe the next question, number two, the next question is, what are you really passionate about? Not what you're supposed to be passionate about. What are you really passionate about? Well, there's three things that I think will tell you what you're really passionate about. Maybe you want to write these things down too because this would be a good conversation. I call them the three C's. You show me your three C's and I'll show you what you're passionate about. The first C is your conversations. Whatever you get to talk about, whatever you're in a long drive, whatever, you, you know, you're sitting down for a moment, you want to talk about something, whatever you talk about shows what's in your heart. Jesus said, from the mouth, the heart speaks. The heart informs what we say. Watch what you say. Watch what people say. You'll know what they're passionate about. That's the first C. The second C is your checkbook. I'm talking about wine and money today. This is crazy. I hope I come back someday. Uh, think about this one. Your checkbook, or maybe you're like, oh, I don't have a checkbook. How about your cash? Okay, that, we'll do that C. Well, I don't have any cash. How about credit cards? You're like America. Okay, very good. That's, we don't have any cash or checkbook. We have credit cards, right? I get it. But it's your money. The second C it has to do with your, your funding. Sh uh, show me what you spend money on, and I'll show you what you're passionate about. You don't want to know how much money I spend on coffee. I am passionate about good coffee, right? And my money shows that I'm passionate about good, about good coffee. Uh, I think I have a little sign in my kitchen that says, life's too short for bad coffee. I agree with that. I'm going to die very soon. I want to make sure I drink good coffee. That's the whole point, right? Show me what you talk about. Show me what you spend money on. And then the last thing I think is probably the biggest indicator of what we're really passionate about your calendar. Your third C is the calendar. You know the crazy thing about your calendar is this. Whatever you let into your calendar, you know that's a priority because you have to say no to a bunch of other things. There's so many things going on. We are so busy these days that we can't do everything. So whatever you put into your calendar, 
that's really what you're passionate about. You can say, yeah, I'd really like to come to church, but I just don't have the time, blah, 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 blah. All that kind of stuff. I get it, right? But I know who I'm preaching to right now, the people who actually showed up to church, right? So that's good for you, but let's just be honest about it for a moment. You show me what you put in your calendar, I'll show you what you're passionate about. You put those three things together, what you talk about, your cash, and your calendar, I'm telling you right now, those three things will tell the truth about what, what you're really passionate about. So let me see if I can get this. Next question. Because that's all I have for my message here. I got three questions, seven questions. Oh, this is what I want to say. Watch this. As much as that's a great question, what are you passionate about? What am I passionate about? That's a fun question. Since we're in church, I'm going to ask this question, a third question. It's nice that we, we all have passions about different things. We're really passionate about. But here's the question that I'd like to entertain right now. What does God want us to be passionate about? See the difference there? So much of our lives is about us. I want to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to do whatever. If I understand the Bible correctly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 6, it says this. You are not, your, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, here's what the book says to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, You have been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. You are not your own. Guess what, American Christian? It's not about what you want. It's about what Jesus wants. And we all love Jesus as Savior, don't we? He died on the cross, he shed his blood, and he rose again. That message has changed my life. I'll tell you some of the story in a little bit. But it's changed my life in such a dramatic way. But you know what's really changed my life? The day that I understood Jesus wasn't just my Savior, he was my Lord. That was also a big boom in my head, right? I was like, wow, not only does God want to save me, he wants to tell me who I should marry. And back then when I was single, I was like, who I should date. Now I'm clear about those two things. I'm married and I date my wife. Hello. Hello. I know who I need to date, right? I'm good with that. But you know what? So many of us just want Jesus tucked in our pocket. So we get our get out of hell free card and we got a weird kind of a Christianity in, in America that lets us do whatever we want to do with our lives, whether it glorifies God or not, and I could still go to heaven. You know what you won't ever find in the Bible? That. That. That is an, a, a Christian, that is not, that's a uh, first, 21st century American thing. That's not in the Bible. Jesus doesn't have just Christian people. He has followers. People who say, I'm going to follow Jesus. So the question I'm asking you is, what does God want you to be passionate about? Well, I got great news for you. He hasn't, he hasn't left us wondering. Open up your Bibles to Mark. I'm going to go up here and get my glasses now. Mark chapter 12. Let me hear some of those Bibles flipping around. Mark chapter 12. Surely, surely you're going to open your Bible. Mark chapter 12. Oh, let me tell you what's happening in Mark chapter 12. They want to kill him. Who's they? Religious people. It is religious people. You read Mark chapter 12 in the first part of the chapter. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're all trying to trick Jesus. They hate Jesus. They want to kill him. And listen to me now. You've got to beware of religious people. Religious people are so religious that when Jesus shows up, guess what happens? They don't recognize him. That's how religious people end up in hell. That's how they end up away from God because they're into their religion. They don't recognize that God Almighty is standing right there. And you know what else they're trying to get him to do? They're trying to get him to say something politically incorrect. Oh, we don't live in a day and age like that, do we? Hey, we're going to bait you with a question, and then we're going to cancel you. Oh, my goodness, that's exactly what was going on 2,000 years ago. Pick it up at verse 28. Let me show you. Then the, the debate continues here. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked this question. Now, here's the question. 
of all the commands, which one is the most important? I love this question. First of all, you need to know this. In Jesus' day, they took Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, the Torah, and they counted all the commands, and they came to this number, 613 commands. Things God wants us to do or not do, but very clear commands. Great news, friends. I do not have 613 points to my message today. And all God's people said, yes, boy, yeah. We, that's a hard message right there, right? Don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, right? And they love to debate amongst themselves. The Jewish people love to debate amongst themselves out of all 613, which one is the most important? So this was something that was asked a lot in Jesus' day. Now, I don't know. I love this because it's a man asking Jesus which one. And I just have to believe that the way God made females and males plays into this little story. My wife uh, has birthed seven kids of mine, and six are girls. Yes, you pray for me. I got a lot of weddings ahead of me. And I am a missionary. So think about this for a moment, all right? I might need to rent your place at a real low, uh, real low rental price. And uh, seriously, women are so beautifully different than men. And I'm not talking about the obvious physical things, but I'm talking about the way God tends to make them. It's beautiful, right? So women can do 613 things. That's what I've learned by having a house full of women. They're amazing They got this brain that can do a bunch of things. Men, not so much, although there is some exceptions to that, depending on who the man is, right? But me, you know, I got this, my wife's never not thinking. Sometimes she'll come down and I'll be watching a football game. She'll go, what do you think? And I'm going, how much I hate the Bears. Because for crying out loud, they never win, right? I'm so mad at them, right? And then sometimes she'll talk to me, hey, how's it going? What are you thinking about right now? And I'm like, nothing. I'm thinking about nothing. Because every man has a place in their head for nothing. A woman never has nothing in her head. We're thinking about the next thing, right? I mean, this is how how God made us, right? And I love, my wife told me one day, she said, you know why men, you know why men typically are not, you know, thinking of can do 106, 130? She said, I was listening to Dr. Dobson. And she said, on Dr. Dobson, they had this, they had this person who is an expert in when, when God is forming a male child and a female child and how different it is. It says a female child is different than the way God makes a male child. She said that when God is forming a male child in the mother's womb, this is what makes it a male. A shot of testosterone goes to the brain and kills the brain cells. Makes complete sense to me, to be honest with you. That's why I have a nothing place in my head, right? Because of that testosterone. And you know what? I think it's true. This is what I love about this passage. This guy is going, I cannot do 613 things. Which one is the most important? I love that. And what I, this is what God wants us to be passionate about. Look what it says. He says, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus jumps right in. The most important is this. Shema Israel, Adonai Elheinu, Adonai Echad. And that is Hebrew for, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is the one and only. See it right there in verse 29? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Shema Israel, Adonai Elheinu, Adonai Echad. And you know what? Within Everybody that Jesus was talking to at this moment in in Mark chapter 12, they knew immediately what passage Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament. Who's got their Bible? Tell me what Old Testament passage that comes from. That's what those footnotes are for. Exactly. And this is is a part of of a series of Old Testament passages, three different passages from the Old Testament that Jewish people said every day. Three times a day. The first words, the first words in a newborn baby 2,000 years ago. 
the rabbi would come over and grab that baby, newborn baby, and whisper the first words whispered to that baby's ear. Shema Israel, Adonai Elheinu, Adonai Akan. And it just literally, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only. It was the first words. And if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Jesus is quoting it, and he continues. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. Friends, if you want to know the number one thing that God wants you to be passionate about, it's this. Love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's exactly what God wants you to be passionate about. My question is, are you, do you really love God? Not like Him. Do you really love God with your heart, mind, body, and soul? In other words, not just on Sundays. Of course we love God on Sundays. But when you leave here, your business dealings, the way you treat people, the way you handle money, the way you approach problems, does it reflect a deep and abiding and life-changing love of God in your life. Would people say to you, say about you, I've known you for years. I didn't know you loved God. That's a problem. Because that means you think you love God, but you haven't learned to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. In other words, it's everything. It's everything about you. God wants you to be passionate about loving Him. How can we know if we're loving Him? Oh, this is where it gets sticky. Let's look at the passage. Matthew, Mark chapter 12. Here's what it says. He says, Love the Lord your God, verse 30, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then it says, The second, think with me for a moment. What's happening here? They said, Jesus, which one is the most important? Jesus says, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then Jesus realized who he's talking to, religious people. And he says, these religious people are going to say, well, of course I love God. I go to church. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't chew. I don't go with girls who do. I don't do this. I don't do that. It, it's just this weird religion thing that comes over us. And I never miss a Sabbath. And I, I always honor, you know, I, I go, never miss the temple, all that stuff. And what's happening here? Jesus realizes they think they love God because of all their religious duties. And that's not what God says is really love of God. So then Jesus does something that's not in the Shema, that's not in the Old Testament passages that they quoted. So it's just, This is called stringing pearls. A rabbi will take something you think you know. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he says, yes, that's it. But then he says, but you don't understand it. So let me reach over to Leviticus 19.18. That's what he does. He reaches over to Leviticus 19.18. And he says, the second, look at verse 31. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Ouch. How many of you love God? Be honest with me. Raise your hand. Awesome. How many of you have a harder time loving people. How many of you are sitting next to that person right now? I don't know. Don't do it. Don't do it, right? But you see my point? It's so easy to say you love God and then be tempted to give the international high sign to someone who tailgates you. Right? My wife sees my road rage. We're driving down the road and somebody's on me, and they, whatever, they can't want to pass or whatever, and I'm getting madder and madder and madder, and, and I'm forgetting this is a person I'm supposed to love back there, right? And this person will buzz by me and give me the evil eye or worse, and then I want to fight them back, and I start to speed up to them, and my wife will talk me down. She'll say, Bill, Better think about this. You might have preached in their church last weekend. <laughs> okay, I take my foot off the gas. God, help me, right? I love God. People, man, that's a different thing. That's a bit of a challenge. But this is what Jesus says is the most important thing. In fact, 
if you read the New Testament, and I hope you do, in 1 John chapter 4, here's what John says. If you say you love God, but you hate your neighbor, you are a liar. You know what? The, I love the cross. I, the cross reminds me often what Jesus has done for me. He died on the cross, he shed his blood, and he rose again. And when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 15, it has transformed my life and it continues to. But the cross also shows me what God wants me to be passionate about. And you know what it is? Do this with me for a moment. Go like this. Go, love God. It's our vertical relationship. Say that. Love God. Say it with me loud. Love God. Excellent. This is what God wants us to be passionate about. That's my vertical relationship. But Jesus said, love God, and then what? The second is, love people. These are my horizontal relationships. So make a cross with me. Love God. Now say, love people. Love people. Here we go. The cross means, love God love people. The cross not only reminds me of what Jesus has done for me, it reminds me of what Jesus wants me to be passionate about. Loving God and loving people. And boy, do I have some room for growth in that. Do you? Am I alone, church? Am I the only one that's got some room for growth on that? You know, Baptists multiply by division. You know that, right? Uh, I mean, that's how we change the world. You know that. That's, that's, uh, that was our church planning long, long ago, right? So sometimes we don't get along very well. And it's not a good testimony. It's not a good testimony. We need to love God and love people. Jesus says, there is no commandment greater than these. All right, let me ask you another question. This is number question number four. God couldn't be so clear. He wants us to love God and love people. You want to know what God put you on this earth to do? To love God and love people. My next question is this. What would ever make us love God? What would ever make us want to love God? If I understand the book of Romans right, I'm born not loving God. Who am I born loving? Me. I love me. You know what the problem is? You love you. I think of me first. You think of you first. I've had seven kids. Every one of those kids have their mother's sin nature. It is unbelievable. And my sin nature, so there's a toxic cocktail, her sin nature and mine, boom, why are these kids having problems? Well, look in the mirror, Bill Allison and Stacy Allison, uh, because we got stuff we're working through, right? Because I naturally love me. Jesus' love, he lays down his life for you. My love is, I want you to lay down for me. I'm about me. So what would ever make me want to love God? Are you ready? 1 John 4.19. You know this verse. Let me start it. You end it. We love because... See? We love because He first loved us. Can you show me the picture of me and uh, my two favorite uh, uh, women? Here we go. Watch this. The, the woman with uh, dark hair is my mother. The woman with gray hair is her friend. Let me tell you why I love God and I aspire to love people. Because God first loved me. I was born and raised in the housing project. I promise you I got to keep this short. We were pagans. My mom was a child of the 60s. Oh my goodness. Do you remember? I'm not talking about the 1860s. I'm talking about the 1960s now. And uh, it was a crazy time. I mean, there, everything was jacked up just like it is right now, right? And my mom did it all. My mom broke every one of the Ten Commandments, except thou shalt not kill. And she almost killed me several times when I was in junior high. I can promise you that. She came close. And my mom and dad divorced when I, I don't even remember my dad living with us. They were all alcoholics, and she took a job as a bartender. Single mom eking out a living as a bartender. And we grew up in the projects where I, where I grew up. And she became best friends with this lady in the gray hair, although they looked much younger back then. She was a single mom, living the party life too. And they became close friends. Crazy story. The lady in the gray hair, my mom's friend, who was a bartender with her, needed, had a, had a chance to get away for a vacation, but didn't have any money. So she called her sister who lived out of state. 
said, can I come and bring the kids? Can we get away for a couple weeks? And her sister said, yes, bring your family over. We'll spend two weeks over here. You can stay at our house. She said, something wonderful has happened to me and I want to share it with you. Dun, dun, dun. Do you know where this is going now? Right? She had become a Christian and, and she said, oh my goodness, this is my sister and her family's going to come to visit. Come here, I want to tell you all about it. So when Jerry showed up, that's Jerry in the gray. Jerry showed up to her sister's house. All she could do was talk about Jesus. And Jerry's like, great. I got, I'm like, I'm going to be with a nun our whole two weeks here. She, all she do is talk about Jesus. But somewhere in the middle of that two weeks, she heard the gospel about a God who loved her, died on the cross, shed, her, shed his blood, and she received Jesus Christ as her Savior. And then in the next week, they got her into the gospel of John, and she began to read the Bible. By the time that woman came back to our hometown, she was fired up about Jesus. They didn't know what to do with her. It was my mom's best friend, and my mom was blown away by how she quit the job and she began to follow Jesus. And my mom was like, wanted nothing to do with her. She was my mom's best friend, but she wanted nothing to do with her. You know what the Bible says? Men and women love darkness rather than the light. And that was my mom. She knew she was wrong. That lady in the gray, she kept coming over to our apartment in the housing project, and we'd close the doors. My mom closed the door and pretended she wasn't home. Listen, I've been on a lot of pastoral calls over the last 40 years. We know you're in there. We know you're in there. And Jerry knew we were in there. And, uh, but one day she got there before we could close the door, and she came in and she shared the gospel. And then from that moment on, she'd come over, you know, every week or so, and she'd bring her Bible. And pretty soon my mom's opening her Bible, and one day my mom received Jesus Christ as her Savior. And it was so transformative for her. I knew there was a God, but I was having none of it because I was 15. And I'm like, no, thank you. My mom tried to take me to church, not the little Baptist church, because I do have a Baptist background, and I was having none of it. And, uh, and I did my best to get away from it. And then my mom pulled out the big guns. She started to pray for me. You're here today, and your mom's praying for you. Get saved today. If your grandma's praying for you, hit your knees right now. Hit your knees right now because those women do not stop praying. And God hears them. I'm here today because of two bartending women who both prayed me into the kingdom of God. Do you think it's worked? It's the only thing that changes the world. So I'll tell you what. The answer to the question, what would ever make us want to love God? God's great love for me. God's great love for you. My question, my next question to you is this. This is, if you're counting, number five. Where would you be right now had you not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'd be hung over, probably dead, and most likely in jail because that's where my family goes. My mom was the last of 14 children. And we go, we, we, we don't do it anymore because the family's pretty much gone. But we would go to our family reunion on that side of the family, and my mom would list all the people that couldn't make it because they were in jail. That's where I'd probably be right now apart from the grace of God in my life. So listen to me. The question, where would I be? That scares me to death, where would I be? So I am very, very thankful to Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection and how that's changed my life. So let's pause for a moment. I'm coming to a conclusion. The, the sixth question is, so what? It's my favorite question. Nice sermon, bro. So you sat and listened to somebody talk about Jesus and tell the story. So what? It's a great question. Because if we do what we normally do, we walk outside and we forget everything that God spoke to us about. More often than not, that word, God plants a seed in us and we walk out and nothing happens. So it's a good question, right? It's a good question. So what? But it doesn't have to be that way. Listen to me. How many of you, just raise your hand for a moment. 
How many of you, unlike me, I don't go back very many generations. I got my mom and then me. Some of you have known the gospel because of your great-great-grandmother and grandfather. How many of you got generations of Christians in your family? Can I tell you something? That needs to be celebrated. That, not like, I have such a boring testimony. What, you wish you were on crack? Is that really what you want? Trust me, I come from the crazies. It's not fun. There's a lot of problems. I want every generation after me to be told the story of my mother because that's where it started in our family. Great, great grandmother Porky, because that's what her nickname was. <laughs> Did I mention I come from a very earth, earthy family? It's, we're salt of the earth kind of people. And uh, I hope that that moment becomes kind of a legacy for years to come. But what good is it if I just sit my fanny in a church pew and do nothing? I'm so glad Jerry didn't say, well, the pastors will get her. We didn't know any pastors. We didn't never been to church before. We were pagans, which is much like the current country, just like current Canton, current Peoria, current everywhere. I don't think we would have been open to a pastor. So you know what that, that lady is to me? A missionary. And it turns out we're all missionaries. And you need to celebrate the legacy that you have. One of the biggest lies for those of you who have been a Christian and have generations of Christians, I don't have a good story. Listen to me. You were born and raised in the church. I hope like crazy you didn't do all the crazy stuff that I come from. And you think you don't have a good story. When you say, I don't have a good story, you belittle the blood of Jesus Christ. And I would never want to belittle the blood of Jesus. Because let me, the same blood that saved those two pagan living women, the same blood, it took no less blood for you as a Sunday school kid at four years old receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. It wasn't any easier for Jesus to save you because you were separated by your sins. The good news is Jesus saves us all. So here's what I want. I want to, I want to encourage you to do something. Tell your stories. You're going to be having Thanksgiving this month, and you might have extended family there. The greatest gift you could give your family, the most thankful thing that you could be thankful for, is the day Jesus Christ entered into your lineage and it was passed down for generations, and we call that disciple-making. Passed down all that over and over again. So, instead of walking out of here and forgetting it, here's what I want to challenge you to do. If you look in your bulletin, and thank you for putting this in your bulletin, there's this thing called the disciple-maker's prayer. So not only do I want you to share at Thanksgiving your stories of how you heard the gospel and how it's changed your life. You need to do that for your, for your kids and your grandkids. Tell your story. Do not say, I have a boring story. You can say, hey, I was born and raised in the church. I heard the gospel at an early age. Somewhere along the line, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And somewhere along the line, it wasn't my parents' faith anymore. It was my faith. I wished everybody had that story. That's a way better story, right? But now, here's my challenge to you. I challenge you to walk out of here on mission. Look at this, look at this prayer. I'm just going to walk through it. It says, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me a disciple-making way of life in Christ Jesus. That comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. See it over there on the right-hand side? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I, I, this prayer comes from all these passages. What would happen if on Monday you said, as I go through every part of this day, Help me to love you and love the people who cross my path starting with my family. Because that's what it's about, loving God and loving people. Don't let me miss the adventure you're sending my way to live and speak the good news about Jesus today. Draw my heart to you and to specific people you want me to pull close for Jesus-like disciple-making friendships. 
by your word and spirit, because none of this is self-help. It's all God's doing. We join it. By your word and spirit, transform me into a follower of Jesus who loves you, loves people, makes disciples, who make more disciples. And then there's this Latin phrase that we get from Toy Story, the movie. What? To infinity and beyond. And ad infinitum means over and over and over again till the whole world knows Jesus. I'm going to be uh, coming back November 20th to spend a Saturday morning with you. And if you would like to learn how a mom, a grandpa, a farmer, a businessman, anybody, a school teacher, can live for Jesus Christ and make disciples, that's what we're going to pack, unpack November 20th, Saturday morning. It's right over here where you sign up. And I will bring two of my other pastor friends who will come and tell their stories and will come to encourage you and equip you to live the disciple maker's prayer. You've been very kind to me. I hope I'm not in trouble for leaving the pulpit. I don't know if you ever leave the pulpit. But I just got to be with you. You know what I'm saying? I got to be here. I got to be with you. And uh, you've been very kind to me. The only thing left to do, and I do have some, um, I have some little business-sized cards that have the prayer, and I'd be glad to give those to you. We'll stand up here. If you would like one, I'd be glad to give you one for every, all your family. It's the, it's the same thing that you're seeing up there, and I'll give you a little card if that's a little better for you. It has the seven passages of Scripture. But here's my challenge to you. We're going to close in prayer by saying that prayer out loud right now. My challenge to you is from now through the end of the year, every day, pray this prayer. Go on an adventure and see what God might do in your life. Because the whole point of experiencing God here is to walk out there Monday through Saturday. And this is the clearest understanding I have from Jesus' life of how we're supposed to live. We're all, listen, following Jesus would mean a lot more to you if it wasn't just Sunday, but a Monday through Saturday. So pray it with me. Heavenly Father, say it with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me a disciple-making way of life, Christ Jesus. As I go through every part of this day, help me to love you and love the people who cross my path, starting with my family. Don't let me miss the adventures you are sending my way to live and speak the good news about Jesus today. Draw my heart to you and to specific people you want me to pull close for Jesus-like disciple-making friendships. By your word and spirit, transform me into a follower of Jesus who loves you, loves people, and makes disciples who make more disciples Ad infinitum, in Jesus' name, amen.